So I'm really pleased um, that we're able to host three speakers today from the Planet N Group. Um, Nadim Hussein is the founder of Planet N Group. Um, Nadim is globally recognized for his dedication and service to financial inclusion. inclusion. He has chaired the UN's um, Millennium Development Group session on financial inclusion and is the chairman of Pakistan's microfinance network. Um, Nadim um, views Planet N Group as a really uh, um, important player in the social impact and technology uh, growth fields. The company has um, is operating in Pakistan, Egypt, the Emirates, and the UK. Um, Sharia Reza is uh, president of Planet N's international division and CEO of their data analytics portfolio company Albion. Sharia is a graduate of Wharton in INSEAD, and um, he's going to talk a little bit about his uh, journey from student to social impact entrepreneur. And Nadim and Sharia are joined by uh, Lauren Arnold, who's strategic advisor to the Emirates Ministry of Health. Um, she's also a clinician and uh, with a focus on e-health and healthcare social impact. Um, so I'm going to hand the floor over to Sharia, who'll speak for a bit, um, and then Nadim and uh, Laura will also come in. We'd like to just open this up to conversation um, and questions as well. So if you have questions uh, during the talk, please be feel free to jump in. Well, thank you so much for hosting us, Pallavi, and thank you, uh, all of you, for taking the time. And we're very excited to be here and talk about social impact and, and the Planet N group. Um, you know, I think the title of this is Development of Digitization, uh, a new path for emerging markets. But I think we're at a very interesting sort of crossroads, uh, and it's happened a couple of times before, uh, historically, where technology and did a technological revolution has become an engine for a, a nation's development. If you look back at the Industrial Revolution, uh, that was the engine for development of you know Western Europe and, and the U.S. It's, it's how a lot of the people. It's how you gained a middle class essentially in the West. If you look at post-war Japan and South Korea, it was really the electronics revolution and. Uh, new form of manufacturing that sort of propelled them into the developed world. And if you look at emerging markets now, it's one of the, one of the main drivers is fintech innovation. And that's really where we play. And our main missions are really development through digitization and then specifically uh, to increase financial inclusion. We believe it's a basic human right. And the pace of innovation within that sphere has been very interesting. If you if you talk about our previous portfolio company, which was Telenor Microfinance Bank, founded by uh, Nadim in 2006 as Tamir Bank, um, it was using cutting edge technology for its time, and it grew to become one of Asia's most socially impactful, but also uh, commercially viable uh, microfinance banks. We exited fully to Telenor. Um, a year, about a year and a half ago, and recently Alibaba took a 45% stake in the business. Um, that was cutting edge for its time, but if you, you, know, if you hear from Nadim about our, our current models of nano finance and our upcoming FinTech innovations, it's just, it just shows, it just highlights how rapid uh, innovation in the sector is. So as a firm, we have portfolio companies in Egypt, UA, UAE, Pakistan, and the UK. And, uh, you know, we're keen to work with, uh, you know, policy minded or mission based, uh, mission focused uh, students and academics to really, you know, brainstorm and, uh, you know, help the advent of this sector. And um, we'll, be, we'll have Q&A afterwards. And also we offer kind of ongoing internships, sort of term time case study type internships, and then traditional summer internships as well. Those can be on site in the countries that we operate in, or those can be done remotely from wherever you live uh, via Skype and video calling with our portfolio company CEOs. And uh, for example, this summer we had two interns from 
Cambridge, uh, two from uh, UCL and one from Warwick, and they worked on a mixture of data science, microfinance, nanofinance. They worked in our OTT media platform and in our digital pharmacy. So uh, I'm very uh, proud to hand over to Nadim, who's the founder of Planet N Group, but also of Tamir Telenor Bank, and a real pioneer in this sector. Um, could I ask, just before you begin, Nadim, if we could go around the table and have the students. That was going to say that. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we start over on this side. So hi, I'm Karen Scott. I'm with the National Development Affairs Program here studying at Alex and Public Policy. Uh, my name is Anna Ingwer Smith. I'm also with the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, formerly with the Australian Government and our Treasury. Hi, my name is Boris. I'm uh, also the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, I'm from Slovakia and my background is in non-profit sector development. Well, we've met. I'm with the Julius Rabinowitz Center for okay. Public Policy. I'm Marcus Brunema, I'm a professor of economics here and the director of the Penta Plan for Finance. I'm Paul Nix, I'm a first year PhD student at the Science, Technology and Policy Program here. Would you Wilson? My name is Nubi Parton. I was an undergraduate here for four years and now I'm in the MPA program uh, and my policy area is criminal justice. Okay. Hello, I'm Pat Farrell, also in the MPA program, uh, studying economics and public policy. I am Moira Farrell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also in the MPA program, I'm a second year um, studying economics and public policy, and I've worked in financial inclusion before, so I'm very excited to hear what you say. I'm Sam Dearden, I'm working with the Center for Public Policy and Finance, uh, and my previous experience is with USAID. Come on. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when we look at a country, we try to figure out what is our objective and our principal objective in Pakistan is to reduce financial exclusion. Pakistan, like most emerging market countries, has huge financial exclusion. In a country of 210 million people, less than 7.5 million people have access to credit. So that's one of the pain points we see that uh, can be addressed and not. And, and we are for profit, we believe on a double bottom line, we believe that we can create social impact and we can create companies that have valuations as well. Tamir Bank, when we value, when we I exited, was valued at $100 million. We built that over an 11-year period. It's now valued at $410 million. So you can create businesses at the bottom of the pyramid, which creates reduced financial exclusion in an equitable way, but also, you know, uh, are valued, you know, for, for what they do because this long-tail customers, if you scale it, it becomes very interesting as far as, you know, earning and impact is concerned. So if I lay out Pakistan free from our lens, what we look at is that it's a country of 210 million people with 34 banks, but only 7.2 million people have access to credit. A country which has the banking sector as one of the most profitable sector, but only has 12,700 ATMs and about 14,000 branches. Again, a very profitable sector, but SME lending is less than 6% of total lending. So if you are familiar with Pakistan and you know in Egypt as well, the earnings of the banks are coming from investment in government bonds and treasury bills as opposed to lending to the people. So you have a bank license, which the central bank allows you to take deposits from anybody, but instead of lending back to the public, which is the bank's job, because the government has an insatiable you know, appetite for debt because of its tax imbalance of the expenditures and income, they borrow back from the public and it squeezes the you know, banks and it provides a great incentive for the bank because there's zero risk, risk waiting for this investment and there's a huge return. So bankers don't have to do anything. I call them fund managers as opposed to banks because that's what they're doing right now. If they had a treasury department and branches, they could fire everybody else and still be equally profitable because they're not innovating and in fact, uh, they hit me for this and I've been a banker for 27 years so I've been on the other side. You know, I mean, I basically say they haven't innovated since the earth cooled. They don't, have, they don't need to, you know, because they have great bonuses every year and they keep going. But the people in Pakistan who are outside the formal banking net need capital. And if they were able to get into not just lending, but savings, but health and insurance, uh, we think that they would have an economic impact. And you guys who are, you know, economists, you know, can validate that or uh, challenge that. But we think even though if their economic activity wouldn't take place, 
their personal safety nets would be better because they don't have a safety net. You know, emerging markets don't have social security, you know, like you have over here. Uh, if they have, you know, an event that uses up all their savings, they just fall below the poverty line again. Commercial banks are not going to solve this problem because they are not hungry, they have no need to do that. So fintechs or third party people can come in and create huge customer, you know, companies with huge customer base because that's where the bulk of Pakistanis are. But you, you can't do it in the conventional manner of bricks and mortar. So what else does Pakistan have going for it? 80% of Pakistan right now has G GSM coverage. By 2020, it's going to be 95%. There are 90 million people with a unique cell phone and the total number of people are about 140 million. 99% of these people are on a prepaid package. It's very important when I'm saying that because that means they have to go to a physical location to top up their phone. Unlike all of us who are probably on a postpaid package, that means once a month you pay, these guys have to buy airtime in chunks of 10, you know, 10 cents, 50 cents at a time because they can't afford to be in a post-trade package. Which means they have to go to a physical location to actually top up. So there are 90,000 such locations in Pakistan and in emerging markets where you actually go and top up your phone. Pakistan also has now got an emerging middle class which has got purchasing power. The number that estimated is around 30 million, whether it's true or not, I don't know. but. You're seeing lot this emerging middle class creating purchasing power in Pakistan. They don't have to go to Dubai. They now have got malls and everything else in Pakistan where they can potentially buy as well. Pakistan also has a very odd demographic as far as youth is concerned. It has close to 60% of its population under 25. And the people who are graduating every year can't be absorbed by the industry, simply can't. So that unless you create alternative means for them, to get gainfully or become entrepreneurs, they'll become kind of entrepreneurs you don't want them to do, which I call a reverse ATM, so a traffic light, they relieve you of your wallet, your watch and other things, as opposed to you know you making a deposit. It's just if you don't have a source of livelihood, then you have to find something to do. Uh, so those are the kind of dynamics, dynamics we look at and we're saying, uh, if we try and connect, also one more thing, Pakistan has 3 trillion rupees which have been printed but not in any bank account. We're a cash society. Everybody uses cash. Uh, so that's another issue that, you know, how do you get some of this cash to start coming in? Because remember, if the banks were doing the job for every dollar they get, they can lend nine times or eight to ten times because they have a leverage of at least 12 if 8% is the dissipated capital. So that's the challenge and the, or the landscape we have. We want to address we want to bring some of this cash in and make Pakistan more digital as opposed to a cash society. We want to be able to address those, you know, 100 million customers for lending, savings, health and life insurance policies. And we've got to find out a way to use a railroad because we can't afford to build our own railroad. We can't go and build bricks and mortar branches to address that. It's just not commercially feasible. So Pakistan has some other things going for it as well. Like most emerging countries, it has a universal identifier which you guys, you know, probably would be customer privacy issues or what, but every Pakistani has a identification card, which is now electronic. It has a chip inside it. It has your date of birth and has other information inside it. And there's a central database called Nadra, which you can verify that identity real time online for a fee and that's owned by the government. So that's a big issue as far as identification and KYC is concerned. If you have that, and India has launched the same thing as the Aadhaar card, I don't know if you're familiar with that, which is again doing the same thing. Two years ago, the Ministry of Interior said that a lot of terrorist activities are taking place from people using anonymous SIMs. So what used to happen is I used to go to a telco operator, distribution agent, and I would say I want to get a new SIM. He said, please give me a copy of your central identity card. I'd give him a copy, he'd give me a SIM. You would then sell my copy to five of you over here because you wanted to speak to your girlfriend and boyfriends without your name appearing over there and you would take a number in my name and you would pay every month correct me you know, honestly and I wouldn't even know about it. So a lot of people were then making calls which you couldn't identify who the individual was. So the Ministry of Interior said if you want a SIM, get biometrically verified. So 90 million people in Pakistan are biometrically verified. 
you can't get a sim anymore unless you're biometrically verified. So two things happened. One thing, the industry lost 30 million SIM providers because they were spoofs. Secondly, the industry had, the telco industry was forced to put in machines for biometric verification which still exist at the agents where they put the machine because you had to go to an agent to get biometrically verified or your SIM would be discontinued. Now again, this is huge for KYC. If I have 90 million people who are biometrically verified, I can go to the regulators and create very different KYC requirements as opposed to the traditional face-to-face -face requirements. One of the consequences was this was that we now have in Pakistan a one-minute account. You can open a level zero account, which means that you can transact on a monthly basis, 20,000 rupees is 200, $200 worth of transactions. And if you want that account, you don't have to go any place. You just have to send an SMS to a bank which has the telco as a partner based on your biometric verification. Your number is tied into that because you can only have three SIMs maximum. And based on that, we can do online verification and open an account for you. Now, what's the implication of this? Uh, since 1947, commercial banks opened about 40 million accounts for people. Through this one minute account, there are the additional 32 million accounts right now. We've got mobile wallets. A mobile wallet is what? A mobile wallet is just a bank account accessed by a phone. So what, this is just a very clear case of technology being used to provide people and financial inclusion intervention. Because the moment you have a mobile wallet, you're starting to put some money in it, into your mobile wallet and you're coming into the formal system as opposed to just using cash. The moment you have a mobile wallet, we can start using artificial intelligence to determine, we could even give credit to you based on the activity you do on your mobile wallet. So this change starts by just the simple thing of having somebody having a mobile wallet and instead of just using cash, starting to use electronic money. But the challenge we have is that in a country, you know, like the population we have, and I keep coming back to this number, you know, is that the locations where you can actually use credit cards and debit cards are only around 110,000. So you can't use plastic in more than 110,000 locations and the people who have got mobile wallet, the use case for making physical purchases has still not been established. So if I have a mobile wallet, I can pay my utility bill, I can transfer money to somebody also who has a mobile wallet or who has a national identity card, but I can't go a shop, to a shop and buy this bottle of water with electronic cash, which is what India has been able to do and Paytm is the biggest example, they've established five, five and a half million locations where you can get digital, use digital money for getting physical, you know, goods. And that's very, very key because that is the biggest use case for a mobile wallet. So if you look at household expenditures, you say, okay, what, what, what happens? You say, okay, guys paying rent, grocery shopping, transportation, school bills, you know, and, and there's a list of the biggest items you household spends. Now, if you don't build a use case for the mobile wallet in this, you know, use cases, then you will have accounts, but they'll be inactive, which is what we have in Pakistan. You know, 30 million mobile accounts for less than a million active. And an active is a very generous definition of one financial transaction per month. Okay, so our aim is to figure out a way, increase acceptance, increase the amount of balance in that mobile wallet, figure out a way how to lend money to people who have no credit history. And Three of our companies that we've established are focusing on that. And as I said, uh, in our first iteration in Tamil, we were using the bricks and mortar approach where, I mean, people question the efficacy of microfinance being that, you know, the interest rate is too high. And therefore, the lending rate that you give to, are you people, you know, looking at microfinance, any of you? Okay, so why do you think the microfinance rate is too high? I mean, why, why, let's say the money market rate in a country is 10 percent and I vouch, you know, guess that the lending rate in that country was 10 percent would be around 32, 34 percent. So why does microfinance is 32 percent and a corporate lender is going to be at 2 percent plus, you know, the lending rate 12 percent? Right. So my understanding is, is limited to the domestic context and the bell industry, but often the people who are within that market don't have credit history, so it's riskier, which makes the rates higher. 
And in addition to that, since the um, um, amount of the loan is smaller, there's more administrative, like um, administrative costs are like a much higher proportion of, of like the amount of money that's being lent. So uh, let, let's just say, uh, so I'm segregating microfinance from subprime lending. Okay, so the default rate is very low. The default rate globally for microfinance is under 2%, maybe get to 3%. So it's not the risk issue as much. The poor are better, you know, creditors than the richer or the middle classes. But your second point is where the key is, that if I go, if I go to a microfinance customer, do they have an audited balance sheet? Do they have a broker report? So how am I going to assess your risk? I'll have to assess your risk by physically sitting down with you and determining your cash flow. And that's a very manual intervention. So of that 38%, if I said that 12% is the cost of funds, 2% default, and I'd say that's a 3% return, so we're up to 15 The rest is all cost of administration. So that cost of administration is what makes this rate high, not the return that the microfinance bank is making or its default rate. So if you can crack that cost of administration by using technology, you can bring this rate down appreciably. And this is something that the new company we are forming is going to try and do use technology. But that's, yes sir. So how's your approach differ from Ant Financial and China? Is it seems like the same business model? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty, pretty, I mean, we, we wish we were more like them, you know, <laughs> in terms well, of scale. Ant Financial was the, was the part of Alibaba that bought our previous firm. So they've come to Pakistan now and they bought our company, which they bought it two years ago as opposed to one year you know, when I was there. So, yeah, but, but you're right. We're trying to create what, what Ant has done to a certain extent, but we've got another dimension. Ant is focused on creating wallets and merchants. So are you focused more on the payment system or the credit? Both, oh. both, both. What we're saying, so let me give you two examples of what we're doing and it'd be interesting to get your feedback because I just don't want to talk. Let's say, uh, let, let's just create a hypothesis. Let's say we want to get 10 million people who have no credit history into the lending market, right? But what do these people have? Let's say uh, they have a smartphone, okay? That's all which is a commonality in this you know, 10 million people we want to assess. So how would you, what was one of some things that you could try and give them credit? Would you give them credit for a year? We have no credit history. There's no FICO score. But, you know, sorry? So you probably, intuitively you say, well, no, this is a high risk segment because I don't know whether this person is employed or not employed. I don't know what their asset is. In microfinance, I physically go and check everything. Here I'm saying I'm not seeing you. I just have data from your smartphone. If you're going to give me access to your smartphone, I'm going to scrape 12,000 data points from it. And based on that, I'll create an algorithm which I think will create a proxy whether you're a good or bad customer. Now, this has already been done. We are not you know, reinventing the wheel. But we are doing some things that I'll talk about which has not been done. But let's say you want to create that company. Would you want to invest in it? You want to take a risk on this? What, what, what data points are you scraping? Everything and ev ev everything and anything that exists in your smartphone. So I'll take your contact list, I'll see your viewing habits with your consent. And this is not small written items, Google or you know, we've got the app in what we call Roman English, Roman Urdu, which is Urdu written in English is how people communicate. And they're very big red kind of say, We want your contact list. We want you know your uh, SMS list, we want your uh, viewing history. And you say yes, 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 yes. So you say no. If you give us enough of this yeses, we can create a score. If we don't give enough, we say, we say unfortunately we can't score you. So I'll, I'll come back to something else because you know how do you create? So because the bigger point is if you most of you are public policy. So there are 2.5 billion people in the world without access to credit, and this is a chicken and egg because they don't have access to credit because they don't have the FICO score, and they don't have a FICO score because you never borrowed before. So how do you create a score? for these people and why do you want to score for these people? And my contention is that if you really want to address financial inclusion, mainstream lenders will have to lend because they are the only people with the kind of liquidity to address 2.5 million people. Fintechs like us maybe will address 10 million people or we are really good, maybe we will go to 20 million. But in Pakistan the need is 150 million, I can't address that. But if I was to create an algorithm which I was willing to underwrite and make it available to mainstream lenders, so I would knead the dough, bake the pizza, put the trimmings on, 
give them a cutter and give it in front of the commercial lenders and say, hey guys, please lend to this. Then they might because their current DNA and the current business model does allow them to do lending for this small denomination. But if you did all the work for them, then they might be able to use their balance sheet. It's only then we'd be make a dent on this financial inclusion. Companies like us or companies like Branch, Talha, Jumo in Africa will make a dent because our capital is never going to be a billion dollars. We may be worth a billion dollars, but our capital won't be a billion dollars. Only these commercial banks have this liquidity. So you've got to, if you're a policy guy, you know, the central bank should be coming to us and saying, create a product where mainstream lenders can lend to this without taking undue risk. So that's another project that we can talk about that we are working on, but we are validating that hypothesis by lending ourselves. So we've done, so how do I create an algorithm? Uh, I mean, we're just talking now, so I want to be more, you know, just for never. How do I create an algorithm for, you know, people I have no database on? Figure out uh, what their uh, their gender is, and then blend only to women, which is what a lot of microfinance does. Because it works better. <laughs> okay, so like, like, I'm, yeah, I'm just not sure, like what what kind of points you're you're picking up on. So I said I'm picking I mean, up can, everything that exists in you. Can go to Rand Financial and see their path. I'm Sorry, go, you can go to WeBank or anything. They have. Algorithms at least yeah, but algorithm vary by country. So I would say no, the algorithm no, I create, you know, in Slovakia would be more relevant. I need to create a bespoke algorithm. So what I'm saying is, how do I create the algorithm? I want to create my own algorithm for Pakistan and I'll create one for Egypt. So I just do a blind test. I say, okay, I create an app and I say, do you want money? And you said yes. And I said, please apply. And all of us apply and I give loans, $10 to everybody. And that's my price for getting your data. And out of the loans that I've given to everybody, all these people default and only people pay. And now my artificial intelligence algorithm comes and says, what's the commonality of persona of people who've defaulted versus people who've paid? But the default will depend whether you roll over the debt or not. Sorry? No, I don't roll over the debt. I've got a one month loan and you've got to pay me back in one month. And if you pay me back, I'll give you a new loan. Okay. So, but you've got to find liquidity to pay me back in an entirety. So you borrow from your friend and then you borrow again. But if you don't pay me that money back, I can't give you another loan. So I need another bridge loan later on to signal to you that I'm... Yeah, so you can game me. I mean, you can... Uh, be, be, but, but over a period of time, my algorithm will pick up, you know, uh, the but game. If, thing. if people figure this out, then they will just try to play on this. Yes, what I'm saying. You, you, can, you can... So many people will try and game us, but eventually, the people who are gaming us is a small percentage of, as opposed to people who are actually taking the loan. So I'm prepared. I'm going to have a 10% default on this algorithm. And I'm going to price, you know, this product as such that I can cover the 10%. But what's interesting is, what is the commonality of in people that have defaulted? And the machine picks this up. I don't have to pick this up. So the more data I get, so this is the price I have to pay for data. So I'm, I did a pilot for 10,000 people and another company will do a second pilot for 10,000 people. And in the first pilot, we were totally blind. Whoever applied, we lent money to. We didn't check in the credit bureau whether you had a bad credit history or not. We just gave you money. We didn't check you were male or female. Incidentally, now in microfinance, this women lending thing is being gamed. So if I want money, I'm going to get my wife to you know apply, and I'll take that money. So you know this whole concept that Dr. Yunus created is women are better creditors. They are, but now they're trying to you know game you. So you can be gender agnostic, or you, you know you can convince. So I have to have a hypothesis which says who's going to take this loan. So my hypothesis is students will take this. Housewives will take this, uh, blue collar workers will take this, and maybe retirees will take this. That's a hypothesis. So the hypothesis is going to get validated or not through the pilots that we do. So our pilot has to be totally unbiased, anybody who applies, but we want some population in these four segments to look at their behavior. Because that's our assumption. And we may find out our assumption is wrong, and there are new segments sitting over there who are taking a loan which we didn't think about. But that's what our in initial research when we started. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so, so what we do is there are uh, 11 questions that you have to fill in and give us access to your phone. Some of those, a lot of the stuff we want to be able to pick up from your phone rather than ask you that because the more time you take to fill in the question, the greater the dropout rate. So you've got to make this very, very customer friendly. But if you ask, if I ask them 30 questions, you know, I'll probably get a 90% dropout rate. If you, if I ask you to go out of my app, you're going to drop out because, uh, but although very honestly that if you're selling somebody something, they'll drop out much more, but if you're giving them money, they'll hang on. 
Okay, and, and, and answer your question. Yes. Are sir. these questions asking what they're doing with the money? And yes, the it's also asking that. So what we're saying is, if, to make life easier, we've got a category. And you can, all of you can download Taste Financial. So, no, you won't be able to because it's Pakistan. So, but anyway, uh, if those interested, I can share the questions. So we're asking you, what do you need this money for? Are you, you know, is, is it an emergency? You have a hospital bill. You want to buy more groceries. You know, your son's going to school. You want it for the fees. Because it's a one-month loan. You're going to have to pay us back at the end of the month. So it can't be a longer term saving program. You got to, it's an event that's happened in the month in which you don't have money for. Or you, 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 you know, buy for shoes if you want. That's what you think you're going to, you're going to tell me I'm going to need it for this, but you buy shoes with it. Bottom of the pyramid, as you know, has two needs, productive loans and liquidity management. And a lot of this liquidity management could be consumption. I don't know because I can't limit or, you know, the use of that money. Money is fungible. So you could, in my question, say, yeah, I need it for the doctor visit and go and watch a movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. But socially, it's more desirable to make it for productive loans. Because yes, but how do I do that? There are many people who just take out loans and then they're stuck at the end of the day. You have this whole population just in Yeah, that, that's true. And, and if you look at Africa, you found people, because that, that's, it's a, that's, that's the dilemma, partially. If I make it so easy for you to borrow, then a percentage of you will borrow just for consumption purposes and you'll default. And if I give you $10, you might even default for $1 and I'm going to take your name and put it in the credit bureau and you'll never be able to borrow again. So it's a very steep price pay. That's my only stick for you to repay me because your credit history gets impacted. So now one of the dilemmas is that there are people in Kenya with two cents of default. Because that's an interest that was charged, we didn't pay or wasn't aware of, and they're in the credit bureau and they're out squeezed out of the credit market. So that's responsible lending would mean that you have to figure that how you're going to stop that. So there's a huge amount of awareness issue and customer protection issue that you know over here that you have to address because I totally agree if you make it so easy to borrow money, then some of this is going to be abused. But our hypothesis is that the bulk of it will be used for people's Liquidity events which they don't have money to go any place to go. And, and you should be able to tell that if you have this data from their phone. Do you still are you still able to monitor their data? Yes. We, so yes. You can tell what they spend it on because they have to spend it digitally. No, they don't have to spend digitally. They can take the money out from the branches bank agent and cash it and then do what they want. We know there's a cash out. So, okay, so now, okay. so absolutely. So what we want to do is be able to track that, but because there are so few acceptance points. They won't use it digitally unless they use part of it to pay a utility bill, we'll track that. If they transferred money peer-to-peer, -peer, we'll be able to track that. Uh, if they electronically went to an e-commerce store and used it, we can track that. But if they physically took the cash out, we have no idea with what they used it for. So one reason why Financial was so successful is that go to the shops and then if you buy from the shops and use your Alipay, then you get a special discount. Yeah. So we're building that net. So that means you have to build a network of shops where you can use that and that's expensive. And that's our second initiative. We're launching a bank, as I said earlier, for the mom and pop stores and we're raising $50 million for that because we want to have a million acceptance locations in our ecosystem where people who've got you know, wallets over here and not just them, but anybody who has a wallet can, can come and buy at these locations. But then the dilemma is separate. You're a mom and pop store, you only take cash. And I come to you and say, you know, guess what? you should accept digital money. And not only that, I'm going to take 0.5% merchant discount rate for every transaction you do when you accept digital money. Would you want that? Yeah, well, that's my customers no, really want it. Right. Managing cash. Sorry? Cost, managing cash is costly too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to protect it and all that. Right. So, you know, what's, what's my sales pitch? So if I go to a large and I go to a CVS, they could say, yeah, absolutely. I get people coming in who've got credit cards, debit cards. And now they have wallet, sign me up. I'll give you 2% because it's going to, people don't have cash in their hand. They've got, you know, they can use electronic money. So, so the merchant discount rate typically is 1.5% to 2%. When you use your credit card at a location, that merchant is paying up to 2% to the credit card issuer, you know, for the privilege of, you know, using their credit card at their shop. But you're a mom and pop store, you know, you just do cash. End of the day, you take your cash and you go home and you buy groceries. I'm trying to convince you to accept digital you know, payments and give me money as well. So what can I give you which would be of use to you? What do you Customer. think the need for a mom and pop store 
is other than the fact as you know the professor said that uh, cash is expensive you have weekend sales where you're going to go put that money if you had a bumper weekend you don't have insurance and you're worried about all that cash you've got you might get robbed something about yes no, but, but cash lets you dodge taxes yeah all right so, so in a country of i'll keep back coming in a country of 200 million people how many direct taxpayers are registered in pakistan one million one million <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah very good one million so right. i'm you can lend to these guys not to the shopkeepers the yes bank exactly so now if i can't lend to them unless i have some ability to determine their transaction flow so i go and tell them that listen if you take digital cash based on your digital footprint in 3 months time I'm going to automatically lend you working capital for a month. So now you said, okay, that's interesting because nobody lends me money or lend me, and I'm not going to lend at a nano rate. I'm going to lend at a higher rate because that loan is going to get repaid on a daily basis based on their electronic, you know, uh, transaction that they shop. So now I'm giving them something which is of value. But then you're going to say, hey, hold on, you're telling me that you're going to give me money based on the electronic transaction that my shop, but who's going to come and do this? how am i going to incent my walk in guy who's doing cash to use electronic money at my shop i'm just wondering about kind of the tie in of whatever mobile money platforms exist in pakistan to your app like are, are you connected in in any way yeah we connected with all of them because we don't have our own wallet right now so we push money into an existing wallet so our usp is that we give you money in your hand in 12 minutes but it have so we have to be linked into people who have a wallet and their distribution system so they can do cash out so this is all about other people's railroads and pay as you go i can't build re- replicate i don't need to replicate the distribution ex- that exists from the existing mnos uh, you know and i'm just going to pay them every time i use it and the main transactions in those markets are person to person not person no it's person to business uh, right now it's person to person but it, i want to make it p2b i want to that physical purchase that you want because if i have that footprint then i can actually lend this person credit now the one of the issues one of you talked about is that cash hides taxes but i'm saying there only a million taxpayers in pakistan so i can do an indirect tax over here if there's a financial transaction i can charge some kind of excise the government is going to make me do federal excise duty but what if i went to the government and i said and we have naya pakistan new pakistan which for me is a joke but that's what the new prime minister is saying is new pakistan and all these people behind me were corrupt they were lazy you know i'm going to change everything the fact that i have the same cabinet from those other parties doesn't make any difference okay if i went to the federal bureau of revenue and i said guys i can increase your tax base number of people who are doing this from 1 million to 2 million i can do 100% increase isn't that optics great then said yeah so, so but the caveat is that you have will have to do a full and final determination of only the electronic transactions don't go after the cash and you have to give a tax holiday and i'll get you another million national tax identity numbers and those people who come above the minimum threshold of income are going to start paying you taxes so i don't know what they're going to say but it would mean that over time this net which they can physically never get to might start becoming part of the tax system but what do we are also doing is that when you creating this electronic money this 3 trillion rupees starts coming in into the system because right now the biggest use case in pakistan is domestic remittance so you go to an agent you give him cash you give him the number of the person you're sending it to and the identity card number in one minute that money is available in 90000 locations other guy comes in and you have to get a password and what do you think that password is for people who are not financially astute 123456 but there's very little fraud because on both sides now the biometric so the person who's sending the money has biometrically verified the person receiving the money is biometrically verified so it doesn't matter what the password is is biometric data to cash out Yep, now you do. Yep, and if you're using biometric, the limit is doubled. But not every agent has biometric, so those agents where you don't have biometric, then you're not using biometric cash out. So what I was talking about, you know, because you had to biometrically verify the entire same industry, there are like about twenty thousand locations where you now have biometric machines for both cash and cash out purposes. So that's why you work. Yes. So what's inflation rate in Pakistan? 
about eight nine percent. How much do you pay interest on the money in the wallet? Yep. You could incentivize people to use this wallet by paying interest. Yeah, but you know, right now, if I'm going to pay the half percent that I'm uh, only that I'm getting from the agent is going to be a loss making proposition for me for monitoring them and providing them machines, providing e code. So I need to use the balance in the wallet to actually uh, compensate. Otherwise, I'll have a loss making proposition. But what we're saying is, the government come to you and says, I make some, if you bring me all these new tax identification numbers, that's fine. But they're also losing Xenorich. They're losing? On Xenorich. Because this inflation is essentially a tax on cash holdings. Right. And that's, you will cash in instead of the, yeah. instead but, of the government. Right, and the government see it like that, you know, but the, this, the, the, the tax that you, you know, the inflation and you know, view as a tax, you know, the, the, they could, but they, they don't. They don't. But, but what we're saying is that, how do we, right now, the entire tax is 90% indirect. So anything you buy, there's taxation, but that's regressive because my income is different than yours, you know, you make 100,000, I make 10,000, but you pay the same amount for any good deal for gas, for, you know, at the petrol pump. So that's how the government collect taxes because there's nobody paying direct taxes except people who are salaried because they're caught. But what you're saying, you want to bring these people in the net, but you've got to do it in steps so that they don't get spooked and to say, you know, I'm now going to be, because tax offices in Pakistan are notoriously corrupt. Okay, so once you get in there, you know, it's Hotel California, they'll figure out ways to squeeze you in many ways. So we've got to get this behavior change working out. But, you know, for us, Honestly, these are all opportunities. How to figure out to get scale and how to make. And the government is, you know, our, our regulators are very forward looking. The branchless banking regulations they created, specialized license for microfinance banks they created, I money regulation has just come out. They've created new regulations for onboarding merchants. And we are finally creating regulations for crowdfunding, which don't exist in Pakistan right now. So that's their frame, and they, and they have a national. I'll come back to you. Uh, they have a National Financial Inclusion Council where they're actually saying we want to get this three trillion back in the system, and they're working. That council has both public and private sector people who are trying to figure out how to, you know, get the people who are totally outside the banking system, financial system, coming in. But coming back to saving, the bottom of the pyramid doesn't just save in bank accounts. They save in Roska's this committee system, which you may be familiar with, rotating saving schemes. They save in gold and they save in, you know, if they're rural areas, they save, you know, by investing in animal husbandry, animals. So we've got to figure out a way how to provide a saving vehicle for people who are buying gold for saving purposes as opposed to speculation and people who are doing Roskas and how to institutionalize that. Same thing on the health side. How do we create systems that are not just limited to life insurance or inpatient health, but ability to get diagnostic over the phone because you now have a phone and you can actually talk to a doctor as opposed to your GP who will never pick up your call, GP is general practitioner, or get an online pharmacy where you can get you know medicine delivered to your house or have people come to your house and take blood tests. So those are the kind of things we are working on again for this challenger bank phase. And on the other side we are working on creating a bank for the mom and pop stores. Those are the two initiatives, the three large initiatives we are doing. I'll talk about the third one, but how, any questions on these two? Um, how does the interest rate on your uh, loans compared to other microfinance? So, if you're doing nano, and if the microfinance bank rate is 34%, and that 34% we talked about the biggest composition is administration, not default, compare that now, sorry, that's microfinance, that's 34% per annum. And now I'm doing nano, where I know my default rate is going to be 10 to 12%. But my cost of administration is high or low? What would my cost of administration? It's lower, but I'm, I would be, because it's kind of digital, but I would be worried that it's like artificially low, because it's ignoring some risks. So that's yeah, but by, by, by definition, it's going to be a fraction of this, because I'm never visiting the customer. Mm -hmm. I'm just accessing the phone, and I'm dealing them through the call center. So. If I have 100,000 customers here, maybe I have 200 people here, I have 20 people. So my administration cost is going to get much, much lower, but at the same time, my default is very high. I can never get to a 2% default rate 
because my algorithm can never be that you know accurate that I'll get to a 10 you know 2% default rate. Therefore, lending rates are high, and but they're for a one month loan. You can't use them as the APR and multiply by 12. So you would have a 12% you know month rate. So one month, if you borrow 100 dollars, you have to give back 112 dollars. But for one month, that's primarily that's the consumer loans. No, you can't invest in anything. So if you want to build, you know, a little shop or anything. No, those, so these have so these are not productive loans. These are emergency loans meant to cater for a trauma and an event that you had. If you don't have this money, you'll be borrowing 300 from the money lender or you be, won't be able to go to the hospital or you won't be able to pay your utility bills or you won't be able to pay your children. So these are liquidity events, but we are saying that and you must only borrow that what you can pay back end of the month. And that's why there is an element of consumption over here that people won't repay. I'm all in favor. Just let me make one argument for micro lending. So advising, there's a lot of advising going on if you meet somebody and he figures out whether you're credit worthy or not, but he's also looking over your business plan, he says, oh, I've thought about this and this. All of this is not the case with uh, going out. With Nano, absolutely. But in reality, Professor, the business advisory is far and few between. And it used to exist with non-profit people who have been dealing below the poverty line. And the new microfinance, you know, microfinance 2.0, doesn't do that. It basically lends because it's got Omidyar and Axion and Morgan Stanley as investors and they're not interested in that. They want return on their capital. And therefore, the amount of advisory that traditionally has happened doesn't take place. But clearly there, you're giving a 12-month loan as a higher percentage of productive loans. Although money is fungible again, the guy says, I want it for this extra chair in my barber shop. And he goes and uses his daughter's wedding. There's nothing you can do, unless you, in are doing low-cost housing where you do release of tranches based on actual improvement in that house, or you know the floors been laid, the first roof has been laid, and you release money. You don't know where your money's gone. Let me just one last question. I have to go then. Um, well, I've managed to hold you for 20 yeah, minutes, so we're going fine. So obviously, I'm doing an okay job. Well, <laughs> take some credit for that. Uh, so, N Financial is the largest money market fund in the world. No? Yes. The average yes. account yes. size is eight dollars. Uh, do you plan to do something else? Yes, I but mean, you see, we do mention that you want to open a money yeah. market fund. So, once you, once I have twenty million customers and I have data on twenty million customers, I can do a money market fund. I can do a pension. I mean, I can do a range of things. But I need to have that customer base, and I can only start, in my view, with the customer base, either through payments or through lending. And payments is a fad right now. Everybody and their grandmother is coming up with the payment app. Repayment is seven to ten years payback, but everybody, every commercial bank has a payment app. Every telco has a payment app. So I'm going to get squeezed if I go into the payment business. So I said I'm in the lending business, and those boys who want to take risk on their balance sheet, I'm going to compete with. And the other side, I'm creating acceptance, which is probably maybe one. Ant will do that in Pakistan. They're going to make us competitors. But our hope is five years they buy us again. So right, so we create something reverse engineered that we think they will want because this is exactly what they do. So we financially will be your competitor in Pakistan. Who and, and yes. absolutely. So you know, but they also have like the other Alibaba branches like uh, the Amazons of uh, Typo and all that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so Alibaba's model is e-commerce. In order to do e-commerce, you need three things. You need a payment system. You need people who are creating e-commerce platforms, you need last mile delivery. So they bought the largest payment system, which was Tamir Mike Turner or Microfinance Bank. Then they bought, bought the largest e-commerce player, which was Daraz. Now they'll probably buy the largest last mile delivery. And then they're going to squeeze everybody by creating merchants into e-tailers and then e-commerce players. And when they do that, you're going to get a whole bunch of people who have wallets. Right now they're building up wallets. And then they'll come up with the money market fund. We'll probably be 10% of what they are, but we'll be the second largest if we get it right. And so we'll you, you think there's room for two, two or three players, essentially? Two million, no, no, two, two one million people? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there is some advantage. I think we're more nimble than them. They've acquired a bank that has Norwegian ownership, Pakistani players, and Chinese ownership. So that's not a great combination to be nimble, okay? So we think, you know, yeah. we, 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 the we can. Like <laughs> <a natural safari laughs> okay. So, the, uh, 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 
we, we also have to be realistic. You know, we've taken on Alibaba is not an easy proposition. But look at India. People have taken on Amazon and beaten Amazon over there. Flipkart has done a much bigger job than some of the US players have done over there. So if you have the right capital, Paytm. If you have the right capital... So Paytm is probably owned by Amazon. Now, now. So the original capital came from the guy himself. You know, he's valued you know, multiple billions right now. So we're saying just create something that these guys respect and buy us out and compete with them and be the second largest player. We never get close to them. You know, if we've got 50 million, they've got 5 million. They've invested 110 million in Pakistan to start with. And they see this as a uh, market. Yeah. Uh, does it, I don't, I'm not as familiar with any financials model. Do they also require the same amount of data from potential customers for building this? So they're not doing individual lending in Pakistan right now, but they will. Okay, so and they'll take the same data and they have actually access to GSM data which on feature phones which we don't. So, I mean there are two kinds of phones, feature phones and smartphones. Smartphone, all data resides on your smartphone, feature phone, the data resides with the, tel with the telco. So, they've taken a position of 45% in a bank owned by a telco. So, they can then get that, so they will be having a bigger customer base of feature phones to go to. So, the business, sorry, Telnor. So, the business we're launching in uh, Egypt. We've gone in partnership with the telco because they don't lend, they don't know how to lend and so they're coming in with us and they'll give us the 11 data points we want from feature phones which will allow us to create an algorithm. So point, the bigger point we're making is that emerging markets are coming up with technologies because that's a necessity they have, like the one minute account. I mean I bet you can't go to a bank right there and open an account in a minute or you physically have to have a presence to go over there because you don't have that need. They've got branchless banking agents because there aren't enough ATMs. You have eight, probably for every thousand people, you've got an ATM. We have an ATM for every hundred thousand people. So when you have these anomalies where you don't have what you take for a given, then you come up with innovation to meet that. Now, but I would hazard if I this number may be right or wrong. What's the number of financially excluded people in the USA? Seven million? The number I've been told is close to 50 million. So for me, that's a big market to just do, you know, uh, lending now uh, to these people if I can create an algorithm. Because in each city I've gone to so far, so we spoke at Georgetown and if I go to DC East, I don't see a bank branch. Then we went to Columbia this morning. Thank you very much. We went to Columbia this morning and uh, same thing over there, half the amount of financial inclusion in Harlem. We are going to, you know, Boston. Uh, and I see if, and we're going to go to Philadelphia and I, I can just create models right in the US. I don't have to go to Pakistan, Bangladesh or Kenya to find financially excluded. In fact, we, we have, uh, you know, businesses tackling this in the UAE. Uh, people say to you the UAE is, you know, a fully developed country, but on the other hand, it, it's ex it, it is an extremely developed first world country, but, you know, more than 50% of the population, um, around 5.1 million people, exactly all the migrant laborers, uh, yeah, domestic, uh, laborers, yeah, domestic uh, laborers, waiters, waitresses, who have no access to any kind of traditional financial services, be it savings, be it investments, be it insurance, be it credit. So that's why we're creating a solution for the UAE as well. So, you know, you're, most of your public policy? So what is one of the interests that you have is to figure out how to create financial inclusion in a country? Or is it more health and, uh, you know, uh, education? What about financial inclusion? Is it something that you guys look at, study, yeah. focus on? It's something that I studied and worked, worked on previously. So I last worked in Myanmar where I was consulting for both tech firms and microfinance. Okay. What about other people? Is that something of interest to public policy or it's not taught or is it something that you, there's a course on this, you know, there, on financial inclusion? There used to be a course, but uh, a few years ago and then they stopped it because there wasn't a lot of interest. A lot of people yeah, who were interested enough, in this? Not enough okay. students were, were uh, signing up for it so two years ago. Yeah, because, you know, this smartphone is not a phone. It's a hospital, it's a school, it's a bank, you know, it can be many things to you. So we've got one company where which is called WebDoc where you call up the doctor and you can get a diagnosis based on what you're doing. And you know, if you get a hundred calls, you know what 32 of those calls are, you'd be amazed. It's calls from young girls in rural areas talking about, you know, sexual education because they don't know any place to go but they're happy to speak to a female doctor whom they don't know over the phone to get educated. So it, it's a whole bunch of service, you know, 
you normally in emerging markets you'd go to a pharmacist and say you know i've got a headache give me a medicine and he in his wisdom is going to give you and these are not licensed pharmacists okay uh, they just give you something that they, they want to sell but if you have a ability to get a diagnostic you know for uh, speak to a doctor half the time you know you don't have to go and worry but so again intervention what if i told you that you know we create to one of our companies provides tuitions or tuitions are secondary you know uh our educational aids so to people based on a you know cell phone where one you know we talking to diaspora in the middle east and pakistan pakistan diaspora and they giving them math instructions you know english instructions remotely uh same thing uh, we now have a uh, television uh you know streaming uh, company which got 3.2 million customers so in a household no more you're not worried about who's got the remote because you're watching what you want on your own uh, cell phone so this is changing life in, in my view this is the biggest revolution we've had since the printing press is just changing behavior change and there's some very negative connotations on this so three of us in a car we're not talking we're all looking at a smartphone you know <laughs> on that on that uh, i'm just curious about some of the privacy implications yeah. you know you can imagine the app to call a doctor and getting a diagnosis that I need an operation and then 2 minutes later I get another message from your lending division saying here's a loan for your operation. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, you know, how are you? Yeah, yeah. You, you will get that call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll get a call from a pharmacy buy from us. But that's what data mining is about. You know, but if I take that call so the so when I'm dealing with the pharmaceutical side the different level of issue so there are laws which says i can't take your data and say okay uh this person had a hernia operation i can't share that with pharmaceutical company so they can sell you medicine but what i can do is if all of you guys called me with a similar disease from a particular part of the city and then i saw the similar calls coming from another city i can create a trend without giving anybody's number as to how this disease is spreading or the invent or i can say that the initial call was for x medication and the secondary call people switched without giving any names so i can create a look at trends which is what you know data science can do but i certainly can't use your individual data so the 1.2 million people in a online pharmacy i don't get that data in my data warehouse because they are regulated by a different standard but the people who come to a financial comparison engine where you know we are helping them get credit cards with that's another fintech company we have uh there we ask them can we share your data and then they'll get a call from tay saying that if you don't get a credit card we can give you a loan but let me ask you another question you know so just like borrowing is an issue saving is an issue nano payments is also a big issue you know the bottom of the pyramid needs to make a payment in small magnitude not a hundred dollars and need to pay a dollar so you got to also find a solution there you can effortlessly pay a dollar for the payment of services or per, you know or in app purchases and that's tough because if you're saying that you know use your credit card you know you may have you uh, let's say us credit card is 80% in pakistan there are only uh, 1.3 million credit cards so you can't use a credit card and if you say you use your wallet so okay there are 30 million people using wallets but what's one thing that all of us have in this room right now you have it in right now and there's a currency even if you have zero if you don't have your wallet with you you're still carrying a currency with you right now what do you think that is sitting in front of you and you you got it you have it in your purse some place you have it where's your phone this one yeah what's in your phone many things <laughs> <laughs> other than those things is your air time right so all if you have air time in your phone if you're a prepaid customer you may be paid 10 dollars to get air time or if you're postpaid then you have a limit that telco set for you for the number of calls you can make that's a currency and i can convert that for payments in a in app purchase very simple if you come to an app that requires 2 dollars and you know you give 2 dollars out of your account of air time and you pay them Ah, I finally got you interested. No, no, no. I, mean, I was thinking about in East Africa. Yeah. This is very popular. They have M-Pesa, and literally, you just preload it with money. But that's different. That's e-money. 
uh, M pesa and Easy pesa. It says that you go to a you know distribution guy and you give him a dollar and you have a mobile wallet and that's loaded up as a dollar and that's real. It's fiat. It's actual money. But what I'm saying is that you go there at the same time and you give a dollar and you buy airtime, and you can use that airtime as a currency for in-app purchases as opposed to the cash you've got in your mobile wallet. So you may not have cash in your mobile wallet, wallet, but you certainly have some airtime, and that can be again used as a bottom of the pyramid. But the the issue is that, like crypto, this is not regulated. So if this becomes used for physical purchases, if I go and buy a bottle with airtime. The central bank is going to get very nervous because you now created a currency which they have no control over. But if you're using in-app, the amount is so small that they don't worry about it. So we've got a company called uh, Sim, Sim, not no, sorry, Sim Pesa. Okay, which uses airtime. So if you're watching, you know, a Bollywood show, and you want to pay, you know, one dollar or sorry, ten cents, you can use your airtime to do that. So you monetize that. One of the treatment arms was like mobile money, but anyways, we were trying to get respondents to participate in follow-up surveys, and if they participated over the phone, the you gave them some airtime. Airtime air in the bottom of the pyramid, airtime equals currency. Okay, very simply, you know. So it's funny sometimes, you know, uh, when you're making payments which are not quite tracked, they'll give you airtime cards. So the cop that stops you, you don't have cash, is saying, "Give me a top up." But the funny, it's not the funny. It's the most amazing thing was this has actually happened. You know, my colleague, which one of the CEOs who went to, I think it was Hangzhou or China, invited by Alibaba for a boot camp. The beggars had QR codes. So when the car stopped, you know, said, "Give me my cash." I don't have cash. He was asking for cash. Here's my QR code. Do a tap and pay. Okay. So you know, you're moving. Talk about cashless and what China has been able to achieve in one generation. So we're going to talk. Shah is going to talk a bit more. But I want to say we would like to work with you if you think this is of interest, because we are not economists. You know, we are entrepreneurs and we are people who execute. But you bring a lens to our issues which we don't have, and I think we can benefit from that. So if you wanted to work with us, the the third biggest project I'll talk about, which may be exciting, is that we want to create, as I told you, a FICO score for the two and a half billion people using. Phone data using psychometrics, and that has very significant implications. The data privacy implications, you know, it has, you know, uh, probably exclusion implications. And we would like to, you know, work with some of you who are especially, you know, uh, you know, all graduate students, you know, who have interest in that, to partner with us and do research with us, and we'll actually execute the research, but frame the research for us, and talk about stuff that. Like I was with uh, Professor Atif, you know, a while ago, and uh, I said, you know, we're going to do fractional gold saving, and he said, oh, that's going to lead to speculation. Maybe it will, but Pakistan imports seven billion dollars of gold every year, and people save. So we want to get a lens which we don't have. And if you're interested, you know, Shahl put some uh, uh, contact numbers up where we would like to engage with you. And we're doing this at Harvard. We're doing this at Wharton. But the difference is that Wharton and Columbia, there's a business school. The people, and, and although we're going to the Kennedy School with Dr. Asim, you know, who is Asim Khwaja, but we would love to see how we could engage with you. You want to, you know, give them some more. Uh, sure. Yeah. I had a question about related to this Figo Score project and related to something I'd, I'd written down earlier. But so in a lot of developing countries, people share a phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you avoid assigning a Figo Score to a family? Or yeah, yeah. To I think that, yeah, that's a hazard we have. Yeah. Okay, that's a hazard we have. But my sense is this phone sharing is becoming less and less, as smartphone prices and feature phone prices keep plummeting. More and more people are getting their own phone. But it, it's a it's a hazard. And as a consequence, like I said, we are targeting 10% default rate, which is a function of phone sharing, function of people gaming us, function of us giving money to the wrong people. And 90 percent, we think, are going to be people who are going to be actually using this and paying us back. I have a couple of questions. Um, just overall, so you were saying that you're working on these new algorithms and you're going to be going against Ant, but that you're going to be bought by Ant. So eventually, is Ant 
going to be, if you look over the long run, nobody can really compete with them and they're going to be the government. I think in India, people can compete with them. In Pakistan, with the firepower they become, they, they bring, unless 10 cents comes in. 10 cents can compete with them. Or, a, you know, somebody else with that kind of financial power could compete with them. But we also have very large banks in Pakistan, reconventional lending and ant isn't going there. They're going after the bottom of the pyramid like PR. So, my sense is we can compete with them, okay, but you know, they take 90% of the market, we'd get 10%. Uh, we'd be profitable and get a valuation in our own company. But you think that if you are profitable and 10%, they're going to make, they're going to try to buy you. We want them to buy us. Yes, they would. So, we, we're they doing a reverse engineering where we want an exit five years from now for our investors for taste financial services. But they are not doing the first thing I am talking about which is creating a universal score for the public. Okay. That is no, why we are saying that we do not want to limit this to ourselves. We want to create something for the commercial lenders to be able to lend. Their view is the secret sauce they do, they keep it from themselves. What you are saying is okay, we can keep it for ourselves but we do not have the financial muscle to fund 100 million people but the market can. So, after we have done our funding, we can go to the market. In most of our companies, we will have formidable competitors. We are a small company, you know, we uh, Two years old, we had ten million dollars to start with, and we were valued at thirty-six. And these guys are billion, you know, dollar companies coming in. But I think large companies also bring their own bureaucracy and their own politics, which we don't have. And the other thing is, Egypt is our other law is our other large market. And Egypt's a hundred million people, and they. Firstly, they're about a decade or at least five years away from being on Alibaba's sort of radar or, or the Chinese radar. Um, and they didn't have a traditional microfinance revolution because they were actually having actual revolutions between <laughs> 2011 and 20 sort of 15. Um, so now they're sort of playing catch up, but you know, we will have the first mover and we do have the first mover advantage in nano and micro there. So doing it in Pakistan, even if you're competing with the Alibabas of this world, because there you're really on the front lines, you have, it's, it's a, oh, becoming an extension of the Chinese economy, really, the level of Chinese investment that's happening there. But the products that we incubate there will work well in other emerging markets and have a big social impact uh, in other markets where there is less competition. So that's why it's sort of the, it's the laboratory, it's our main market, but it's also a laboratory to take things elsewhere. The other edge we have over Alibaba is that we share equity. So, yeah. you know, we would have not only top management owning the company, so Plan Dan would have ownership, but management would have ownership and they would be ESOP. So they would probably match the ESOP, but they can't match equity, so they don't give equity. So we know that when we create this bank, we will have people on day one, 30, 40 people who are all people currently in Alibaba's acquired company come join us. Right. Because, you know, we've got this track record and we're giving equity. There's a disillusionment among the management um, that, you know, they signed up for a social impact for profit business that's become a fully for profit business after the Alibaba investment. Alibaba, you know, do not really, yes, there's a microfinance bank attached to it and there's elements of that wallet and elements of that customer based growth that they will use, but then they're, they're, they're not a mission based firm. And uh, I think a lot of the senior management now are not where they signed up for. So you will have people leaving for equity reasons, but also for, uh, let's say, you know, thematic reasons. But I mean, we want to learn a lot from them. I think, you know, they're, they're clearly successful business model that they have. They're There's very a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things to be learned. I mean, they're Alibaba University, you know, they actually create entrepreneurs, you know, on a regular basis. They took 20 people from Pakistan just on a boot camp at their own expense to create linkages. Uh, so they're formidable. But, you know, it's good to have a formidable competitor that keeps you hungry and lean. So, have any commercial banks in Pakistan shown interest in this? So, commercial bank in Pakistan, I told you, are the people who haven't innovated since the earth cooled. Okay? Because they get 70% of their earnings from government treasury bills, you know, and bonds, they don't have to do innovation. Mm -hmm. And their view of digital revolution is, hey, look at my app. I have a very sexy app, you know, press all these buttons. And the back office hasn't been digitalized, so they still take a month to do a new to industry loan. So I don't see them as competition, but I clearly see telcos as competition because they're sitting on this huge customer base and data 
and distribution points. So there the people could really squeeze us if they wanted on the distribution points. But the commercial banks aren't interested in providing anybody. Yeah. The thing about the commercial banks and the thing about why this, this type of finance hasn't picked up in developed market or mature markets either is it's just it's the legacy system issue. In the West, you have a legacy banking system, so it's very difficult for everyone. To, 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 it's, it's very difficult to create a whole new banking ecosystem on the telephone. All it is is a digital version of your bank branch. Similarly, commercial banks in emerging markets, primarily they've been lenders to government and, and corporations. There's commercial lending is not that big anyway, but to redraw the map and move into this, given the legacy systems and the cost structure they have, it's, it's proven globally uh, not a, a path that many commercial banks have successfully taken. Because it's, it's that legacy I issue. mean, other than the technology, you know, as was Charles mentioned, it, it, there are two other things. One is the mindset. And thirdly, it's the just cost economics. You can't have a branch in Wall Street and give out $10 loans. Your, your rent is so high that you're never going to do that. So unless you create a subsidiary which is totally separated, you know, you won't have, you can't mix, you know, bottom of the pyramid customers coming to your branch and standing in line with your more affluent customers. So... You mentioned, an, sorry, interrupted you. you mentioned an emerging middle class in Pakistan. Yeah. The bank are not shifting their retail services at all in response to that? No, they are. That's their, that's their right. you know, center of the plate people they're focusing on. So we, that's not our primary focus. We focus on them for payments but not for lending. We're going after the 100 million people nobody's addressed. Why should I want to focus on people that 34 financial institutions and 8 microfinance banks are going to target who have a bigger brand and a bigger equity base than us? and who can probably initially, you know, have marketing campaigns equal to, you know, 10% of our capital. So we want to address those people. So they're playing, let's say they're playing soccer and we want to play basketball. We don't want to play soccer, you know, where they'll kill us. Uh, so, but by the time they come to play basketball, you know, we'd be cream of the Jabbar by that time. So, you know, that's what we want to create. Any question? I was just going to ask, like a clarifying, are like the banks in Pakistan, are they mostly like state owned? No, there's only one bank which is state owned, the rest of all in privatized and they're all in the private sector and they're owned by, uh, they're publicly listed, they're required, if you're a financial institution, you're required to be publicly listed within three years. So there are no private banks, every bank is publicly listed. In Egypt, most of the big commercial banks have some degree of government ownership. So there, so it's, you know, it's yeah. quite a, in many ways it's an almost identical market, but then in some ways it's quite different and that's one structural way and that it's different is that a lot of the banks have government ownership. So Egypt obviously the military is flexing a lot more muscle to take control, they don't want another coup happening. Pakistan we've gone beyond that, the military is more involved in foreign affairs, you know, relationship with India, you know, security terms, they're not into the financial industry, they're not a big influencer over there. I just have a clarification person. I, I'm not sure that I followed the timeline correctly, but uh, you mentioned that I, I think that it's incredibly exciting in this issue that you can if, uh, create these profiles of people and be able to lend to them at a very cheap rate. You said no, that, not a cheap rate at all. Well, relatively <laughs> yeah. cheap. Cheap to compare to informal to money lenders. To compare to the relative rate. Right, right, yes, right. but cheap also compared to traditional microfinance. No, no, no. Yeah. 12 percent per month. That's 34% per annum. That's under $100. So That's the, the right bank there. we're going to create for the mom and pop stores is going to be 5% less than the market because our technology will deploy. But coming back to your question, sorry. Yes, but the question, but you said that you have been using all this data already. You had done a 10,000 yeah, experiment yeah, yeah. and you were ready to do the we second. We were already doing the second 10,000. Okay, have yeah. you, what were the results of that? What did you find? Who In terms the of. Good, who were the good payment? What characteristics did it? Did it work? How are you tweaking it? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. You want to respond to that? Um, sorry, can you just rephrase? You're saying that the learnings of the first pilot. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the learning of the first pilot is that's how the algorithm learns uh, who the good and bad credits are. And then the more you do, the, the better it gets. But it kind so of it's like machine learning. It, it basically equates the it, it equates yeah. all the data points and a sort and um, sort of assigns them. 
uh, awaiting towards uh, helping your default rate go down. So I think now it's down to about, it's down to, 30, 30. now down to 30. But, but what she was asking about Shah was, what were the commonalities of right. people who defaulted versus who didn't default? You know, the miscalled right. stuff and the... Yeah. You find so a woman how often, again, how often, woman... So some of, the data, some of the data points that came out, how often you snooze your alarm, uh, how regular, how, how regular your G, how regular your GPS patterns are, or if you're just all over the place every day. Those are the bad. Those are, those are, those are bad indicators bad. of the default. Number of yeah, people you, yeah, the number of people you have in your close circle of friends that you contact regularly, or pe uh, how many people you contact regularly, whether you receive so more incoming calls or you do more, yeah, more so out the, outcoming. Sorry, what yeah. Which direction are the? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's good or bad. So, All right. It's good to have a big friend circle. Yes. Yeah. Snoozing bad. Snoozing, Snoozing bad. is bad. So some countries might be good, but it's bad. Being so I mean, they, these are preliminary results. So these are not things that are going to get, you know, this is the first pilot. First pilot was, biggest thing was missed calls. So you're the kind of people who call somebody that hangs up quickly. So they use their data package to call you back. Okay. Ah, All right. Okay, okay. So you, you don't have a, you have a very small circle of people that you constantly contact. So in Kenya, it was established, you had like, I think it was 34 or 36. If you had 36 people, you were concentrating regularly, 6% reduction in cost of, you know, in potential default. It's the other thing very amazing. You're calling your mom, your dad, your siblings, very often, you're a good credit. So now, this is first, first pilot finding. So it may change. Uh, as, if your phone is not on 24 hours, you're a bad credit. You if you have people, if you default, high probability your friends are going to default. You're a deadbeat crowd. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, if you're a yeah. defaulter, you find out that you know all people close circle people are also going to are also defaulting. Initial findings. So this, is, but the, the point is not what the findings. The point is that we can identify the commonalities between people who are defaulting versus not. Whether it's the snooze button, whether it's your propensity to watch a particular kind of television show versus other people. So that's what the, this is what the machine learning is about. It's going to just dig deep and find and then find itself the commonalities between people who default and they will just start profiling. And next time around when you apply, we're probably going to say no because we, this profile of customers is going to default. But the algorithm is not there. It takes 18 months and then it learns constantly. So uh, if the initial default was 60%, the second pilot be using the algorithm for 50%, 50% still blind because we're still learning. But we already we see a default rate down from 60 to 30% percent from by using the algorithm for the 50% that we have. Yes? How many people were in your initial pilot? 10,000. Mm -hmm. Did you experiment only with the short term loans? Or only short term. Longer term? Right, right. It's too early. But the point is that remember, we've got no history of credit on you. We're just taking a punt that we can take proxies from your phone for credit indicators. So even one month, we will give you a week loan, we we'll give you two, two weeks, three weeks, you know, one month, but we won't go beyond one. Maybe two years from now, when we've got more history on you and you're a you know, repeat customer, we'll say, okay, let's give them, uh, you know, a longer loan. But in Tamil Bank, I'll tell you, you were a fifth cycle repeat customer and you still defaulted. So the assumption is you want high recurrence, but you'll also see people who start to game you will take loans, pay you back, take loans, pay you back, get a higher limit and then default. So, you know, when, when we launched credit cards in Pakistan, there's something known as the credit wave. So, what's the credit wave? The credit wave says, I give you a limit of $1,000. So, are you going to take the $100 and default? No, you've got $900 to default on. So, if you go to $900, are you going to default? The chances are you're going to default more then if you've taken hundred dollars because you've used the maximum utility. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take a hit on getting on the credit bureau, I'll default when I've taken the entire thousand dollars rather than the hundred dollars because I'm still going to get into the credit bureau. So the wave comes where the people have actually utilized the bulk of the benefit you're going to give them. And then you need to figure out, okay, how to protect yourself against that. Mm -hmm. Now, from public policy, I would say, you know, you guys should be up in arms. You should be saying, how are you profiling people, you know, and you're going to you know, exclude a whole bunch of people who are not going to give credit because of your arbitrary algorithm. Okay? Or how are you going to protect data privacy issues that you, these guys are not educated enough, you're saying, I'm going to give you control, but are you really going to give control? You're taking everything, you know, from their phone 
and you are creating personas and you might sell it to a third party and these people don't even know. So you know, this is the, you know, a double edged sword. But our plan is that we want to be very responsible because we want to create a global product and we are going to follow GDPR rules. So if I am contracting with you and I say uh, I am going to create a credit history on you and you say yeah sure the first thing I am going to give you is airtime for taking the data from your phone. Then I am going to do a contract which says whatever persona I create on you I am going to share it with you and if you don't like it I stop there. And if I make money from that persona I am going to share that with you. Now that is very different from what Google, Facebook, you know all these guys do. And our view is that most likely under a year Google, Facebook, all these guys are going to have to pay you for the data that they take from you rather than this implicit free app you know that this contract of this free app is obviously very implicit of you know it's a facade because actually what they are getting is far more valuable than what you are getting. Data. Data. I mean it's your data and you should have control over who that data can be used to and be rewarded where if I make money from the data. So that's our model for this two and a half billion thing. That's our biggest challenge. If some of you want to work with us on that, happy to talk about it. because if we do that, that's a billion dollar company. Because even if I charge a dollar per pop for you know getting the score that we've created, hundred million easily globally. You know, if you're talking about two point five billion, you do ten percent, you're talking about two hundred and fifty million customer base. So that's a big market, but you've got to crack this. And the, the challenge is not only creating the algorithm but testing it and putting your balance sheet at risk and losing money till this gets perfected. And that's why some people haven't been able to do that because they don't have a testing vehicle and you've got to test it in every country because the nuance is going to be different. Snooze is good, bad customer in Pakistan may be a good customer you know in the US. No, no. I guess the concern is here is like you clearly have more information on your customers than the NSA has in its wildest dreams. And so it makes you so, a huge uh, hacking time. Yeah, right? absolutely. Or I can get a call from the NSA or the intelligence say, hey, you know, you've got this, you know, 250 million people, we like a pipe or we can shut you down. What do you think? You're immune. I mean, can I take the he NSA was, on? He was asking about the hacking element. Yeah, but I'm saying. No, no, but I'm saying you can get both issues. I can get hacked or I can get a call from an agency and say, we. And what? The big, who, are the, who are the biggest hackers? It's not private people, yeah. it's the agencies. Yeah, it's, it's, while, while you are able to offer these loans because you reduce a lot of overhead, I feel like there's a big yeah. overhead there that so the, is going to be really hard to address. The security uh, of that data is going to be absolutely. very hard to So the, the nightmare is that you get hacked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not that you hire default or your you know, business model takes three years to turn, is you get hacked, which is Facebook's nightmare, which mm -hmm. is Google's nightmare, which is Amazon's nightmare. Uh, so you have got to spend money of the money that you raise on this. But the honest, the other thing is that you get asked to share your data or you know you get gamed in sharing the data you do not even know about it. When you have you know 100 million people in your database across multiple countries many people get interested. So that is another issue. Okay, one last question and then uh, we will move over to the conversation uh, will continue over the dinner, so you can also save your. So we've got. Uh, did you put the? Are you going to share the contact list so that we've yes, got? Yes, I have your slides, and we'll uh, send that out to everyone. So if you want to contact so us, so I'm going to give my cards around. Um, so you have my details, and uh, let's stay in touch on everything. And uh, the presentation, which Palavi is going to kindly share with whichever of you are interested, has. Uh, my Nadim and Lauren's contact details. So, um, you know, we, Lauren can get a chance to talk, but Lauren is a doctor, you know, uh, Lauren Anand, and she graduated from Penn and the PhD there, and she is on an advisory board, and her expertise is the health vertical and what we're going to do in that. So, we're looking for people with this kind of expertise to, to be on an advisory board or, or, or engage with us because we're just learning on this stuff and we want to get global learnings as opposed to just what we've doing ourselves in Pakistan. You want to say a few words? Say a few words, yeah. So healthcare, of course, is changing dramatically. As Nadim said, this becomes a hospital and your primary care provider. So the real opportunity here is to deploy AI and machine learning to gather as much information as possible to do targeted precision-based diagnostics and then interventions for patients and groups of populations. So this is one thing that that we're working on here um, in another company that, that we're working with. 
there's a U.S. play. Um, uh, this organization has a team of about 30 data scientists in Kiev because that's where we found the talent. And through a series of algorithms, pulls, establishes on an app here an individual's healthcare ecosystem, whether it's your doctor or your health system that you affiliate with, labs, pharmacy, etc., and <clears throat> pardon me, runs runs an analysis against standards on a continual basis, and then feeds back to the consumer, as well as the physician or another relevant care provider, maybe a daughter, interventions that may need to be addressed. So this is particularly important for the elderly, as you can imagine, who have daily complex situations people with really difficult chronic conditions, diabetes and other things, or even post-discharge patients who are struggling to restore their health to normal. So, so these are the types of examples of what's happening in healthcare to really disrupt. Great. Thank well, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for being patient listeners. So we, we have some of you, I believe, are joining us for dinner, so we'll have you talk, and honestly, we would like to engage with you if you have an interest in this kind of stuff that we are doing. <coughs> we'd be happy to figure out something that we can jointly get you, get your mind engaged in. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.